we're going to resume shortly, so come on in and grab a seat. Thank you again for being here. It's fun. It's fun to get together, fun to study and visit and learn and grow. So uh, we're uh, we're having a good time. So remember the book table in the back and be able to sign some books, uh, sign some books later too. So all right, well let's uh, welcome back Dr. Bierman. All right, thank you for your attention. Back to back, me twice. I don't know about that, but you're stuck with it. Um, I'll do what I can to keep it engaging. If you, if you do want me to sign a book, I'm happy to do it. I'm th really thrilled to do it. The fact somebody actually read a book I wrote still kind of blows me away. So I'm, I'm thrilled to do it. So if you have one, something you want me to sign, see me after the session, I'll be happy to do that. Um, <clears throat> we ended up by talking a little bit about Luther and the... Um, the whole idea of the world and our engagement in the world. And I said, I wanted to show you one more thing, so I'm going to do that to start with, and we'll get into the next topic, which is the whole idea of virtue and <clears throat> virtue ethics in the church. So we're going to get into that and un unpack that. And I'll give you Q&A time here at the end as, all, as well. <clears throat> and I'll say that in that Q&A time, you can ask about anything you want. Don't feel like you're limited to the discussion. If you just have something you want to ask about you know, what's going on in the LCMS, whatever you want to ask, feel free. <clears throat> I don't know, but you can ask. <laughs> All right. Luther wrote a lot, a lot. Um, we don't even have anything in English yet. It's still stuff stuck off in the Weimar edition that hasn't been translated, so he wrote a lot. But one of the things that he was interested in, um, he went through this period um, when he was lecturing, when he decided um, he's going to die soon, he was pretty sure. So he started doing short lectures on the Psalms because he didn't want to start a long book and die halfway through. And so he just <laughs> lectured on the Psalms. Uh, then he got a second wind, and he lectured on Genesis, and then he died. So he pulled it off. But um, there was a time when he was sure he was going to die, so he was just lecturing on the Psalms. And this is in the 1530s. And what's fascinating is, in some of these shorter commentaries on these particular Psalms, is the, Luther, the direction Luther took. So Psalm 82 is a, kind of an obscure psalm, and we don't talk, use it a lot. But Luther wrote a commentary on it, and his commentary is zeroed in heavily on church-state stuff and on princes and the relationship of the church to the prince. And it's just a fascinating read. Because usually when we think about Luther and the two realms, we immediately go to things like um, temporal authority, to what extent it should be obeyed from 1525. And then we'll go to um, can soldiers too be saved from a couple years later. I guess it's 24 and 26 are the dates on those. And so those are the two of the go-tos. Everybody goes there. But see, those are still in the middle 20s, and Luther's still sorting through some stuff. And there are some moves he makes there that he shifts a little bit and tightens some things down to the 30s. So the Psalm 82, I find fascinating because he wrote it. It was published in 1535. He wrote it about five years before that. But he really pins down some things pretty tightly in here. In fact, in my book, Holy Citizens, I'll plug it one more time and I'll leave it alone. I spend a whole chapter walking through this this, chat, this um, commentary of Luther and unpacking it and talking about why it matters because I think this is in, hugely insightful into what Luther's up to. So the psalm reads, God, God stands in the congregation of God and is judge among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and prefer the persons of the godless? Judge the poor and the orphan and help the wretched and needy to justice. Rescue the small and poor man. Deliver him out of the hand of the godless. But they know nothing and consider nothing. They go in darkness. All the foundations of the land must fall. I said, indeed, you are gods and altogether children of the highest, but you shall die like men and fall like a prince. Arise, O God, and judge the earth, for thou dost inherit among the heathen. You can see why that's a popular psalm. We use it all the time, right? Um, no, I don't, probably none of you, oh, it's my favorite psalm, Psalm 82, I love it. No, we don't. But what Luther does is he says, God is a judge among the gods. And Luther says, well, obviously, gods means princes. This is a book, this is a psalm about government and government leaders, and kings, and princes, and that's how he interprets it. Now, the beauty of my calling at the seminary is I'm a professor of systematic theology, which means I don't have to worry about the Bible at all. And um, <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. I, I just do doctrine, and I don't have to worry about what the Bible says. And so the beautiful thing is when Luther makes a move exegetically, I don't have to evaluate it. He just did it. I don't care if it's right or not. It doesn't matter. And so you can say, I don't think that's warranted. 
fine, go talk to the exegetes. I don't care. And so Luther is making his move here, and he's made it. And he does some delightful things in this commentary unpacking this. Now, the, 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 if you want to read the whole explanation, it's in the book, and you can track it through there. It's some really interesting things. But one of the things he does is he talks about these communities. And he says, God stands in the congregation of God. And he reads this kind of two ways. One way he reads this as the church, the congregation, but he also reads congregation as the wider community, the civil realm, the, the world around, and that God is there in the prince, and his whole premise is that God is judging among the gods. Wow, the cool thing about this psalm is Luther argues, well, how does God do that judging today? And he argues through the pastor. The pastor is the one who judges the prince, and so Luther assumes and takes for granted that the pastor is challenging what the prince is doing from the pulpit when necessary. There you go. So that's what I mean by politics in the, from the pulpit. That's what Luther had in mind, calling out the prince publicly. Luther endorses it in this psalm. Now, I'm not going to get into that. That's a sidebar, but if that entices you at all, read because you need to be convinced of what Luther is actually doing. His doctrine of the two realms is far more nuanced and far more dynamic than we Americans have taken it to be. We've Jeffersonized it way too much, and he is not Jefferson's church and state separation. And I've encountered far too many Lutherans that hear, oh, Luther's teaching the two realms, oh, that's separation of church and state. No, it's not. No, it's not. And don't make that mistake. All right. So anyway, what I want to share with you to start with is when he starts talking about these communities. And he says this. This is a few lines into this. Page 47. Oh, this is, by the way, this is um, volume 13 of the American edition of Luther's works. So you probably have it on your shelves around here somewhere. So volume 13 of the American edition, page 47, <clears throat> which is selected psalms. So he's talking about such communities. These communities he's talking about are the secular realm world, Wittenberg, Erfurt. You think, oh, these are Christian communities. But no, not so fast, because over here he says, observe that he calls all communities or organized assemblies the congregation of God, because they are God's own, and he accepts them as his own work, just as, and here's the kicker, he calls Nineveh a city of God. Well, there you go. So if Nineveh is going to qualify as a community of God, well, that must mean there's a lot of room here for community of God to be pretty broadly applied. Does Minneapolis apply as a community of God, a congregation of God? And Luther would say, yeah. You say, oh, God forbid. No, this is this whole point. If Nineveh qualifies, anybody qualifies, even Las Vegas. All right. Such communities are God's work which he daily creates, supports, and increases so that they, and the they means the people, can sit at home and beget children and educate them. Now, we're going to come back to this part, the begetting children and educating them, because this is what the home is for, M making babies and raising them. That's a big deal, really big deal, because that's the next generation of God's people. So they can sit at home and beget children and educate them. Therefore, this word is in the first place a great and pleasant comfort to all those who find themselves situated in such a community. We all are. It assures them that God accepts them, these communities, as his work and his creation cares for them and protects and supports them as we can, in fact, see with our own eyes. For who can have or keep a cow or a heifer or a heller? Heller is a um, small piece of money. If go, a gold coin. If God did not give it and help and guard it. Therefore, everyone ought to admonish himself to be thankful for everything that is offered him by his rulers and be glad, his rulers, princes, that in such a community he is worthy to eat his bread and live. For this word, congregation of God, is a precious word, and anyone who is in it ought to be ten times happier than if he were enrolled as a Roman citizen, which was once a great honor on earth. But reason does not consider this. All right, so how highly does Luther value a secular community? Very highly. How highly does he value the prince who's overseeing it? 
very highly. These are put there by God. What's biblical basis for this? I will do a little Bible once in a while. Romans 13, duh. I mean, it's just so apparent, and Luther jumps all over that. So there's strong foundation for this. So this notion of secular, we don't have any interest in that, is just so completely wrong and to be ruled out. Now, that's the grounding for this. So they sit at home and beget children and educate them. And this idea of educating them leads in perfectly to the discussion of this lecture, which is virtue in the church. And so that's what I want to talk about now, and this is going to dovetail perfectly into the idea of the three estates, because the three estates, home and state and church, is where we live out our vocations in this world, and one of the major driving tasks of our life in this world, our vocations, is begetting children and raising them to live in the life of the church and to be citizens that honor God. That's what we're here for. It's a huge part of this, and that's clear scripturally, clear doctrinally. So virtue, what are we talking about here with virtue? Virtue is um, an interesting concept because it's gotten a resurgence of interest in recent years. Lots have been written about this. Lots of scholars have gotten involved in this. But virtue goes all the way back, and it goes all the way back to before Aristotle. But Aristotle is one of the guys who's really a big driver of this because he made a huge emphasis on virtue. And that makes people nervous because Aristotle is not a good man, right? In fact, Luther had some choice words for Aristotle. There was a time when he labeled um, Aristotle, and I'm quoting Luther, so bear with me, that damned rascally heathen. And um, he had very little use for Aristotle because Aristotle was teaching that we work at becoming better. We cultivate right behaviors, we cultivate virtues, and we accomplish things. And then what Luther saw was how the church in his day had completely bought into this whole idea of this Aristotelian pursuit of virtue and growing in virtue and made a mess of it. And so Luther had extremely harsh things to say about Aristotle. So there you have it. Why are we talking about Aristotle? Why are we talking about virtue? And in fact, there are a good number of Lutherans who have embraced exactly that position. I can give you a bibliography of people who have written against virtue. There's titles of essays like The Flight from Virtue and Virtue as the Sin. You know, Christians don't pursue virtue, we flee from virtue. Yeah, this has been written. Now, how could a Lutheran possibly make the argument that we should flee from virtue? It's easy. If we believe in justification by grace through faith in Christ alone, and we call that divine monergism, God alone does all the work, what role do you play in that? None? Yeah, come on, you all know the rules. I'm not trying to trick you here. Everybody's always, wait, I, should, I think it's zero, but he's going to, you know, it can't be. No, none. You don't play any role. God does it all, right? AC4, you can believe in that around here, right? AC4, Augsburg Confession, Article 4, justified by grace through faith in Christ alone. I, come on, I know you do. You're with me on this, all right? And so AC4, what room is there for virtue in AC4? <clears throat> none. Absolutely none. Done, ruled out. So flight from virtue, when it comes to justification by grace through faith in Christ alone, yes. <clears throat> Amen. So done. No virtue, no Aristotle. This lecture can be... Wrapped up immediately. Virtue is bad. Don't do it. Stay away from it. You have nothing to offer. Don't try to get any better. Just receive the grace God gives you. You're a worm. Be humble. Receive what God gives you. You can do nothing. Don't try because you're only going to get in the way of what God wants to do because what God wants to do is humble you and make you realize how great a sinner you are so you receive his grace. Don't pursue virtue. Done. Right? Wow. Maybe there's more to this. And I think there is. And the problem then, of course, kicks into what I know you guys have heard about as well, this whole idea of the two kinds of righteousness. A righteousness before God, which is based purely on grace and the gospel that God gives us, AC4 stuff. But then there's this thing about righteousness in the world and living our lives in the world and being what God created us to be in the three estates, in the temporal realm in the material world that God created, that he cares about, that he loves, and that he's redeeming in Christ, and that he's going to restore at the resurrection. That world. And so if we're going to be living in that world, 
Is there a way for us to do that well and correctly? Yes. That means living in conformity with the will of God, which could be described as being a virtuous person. Huh. And so that's where we start to come into this. So the distinction we need to make is which realm are we talking about? If we're talking about the vertical relationship with God, correct, virtue is irrelevant. And how great a person you are and all the accomplishments you've piled up don't make a bit of difference because when you come into God's presence, you dump all that stuff, you come in naked and humble and simply pleading for the mercy that he gives, and in Christ he gives it. That's gospel. And that's awesome. And I will never negate that or deny it because I desperately need it. And I delight in the fact that he just gives it and it's there. But when I step back into the world, which is where God sends me once he's justified me. Because once I have been justified and made right, I don't just bask in the delight of God's forgiveness and wait to die. God redeems me so that I can be what he created me to be. And he kicks me back in the world and says, now go back into your vocations and do what I put you here to do. Go be the husband and the father and the professor and the driver and the voter and the friend and the neighbor that I created you to be. Get busy and do a good job of it. And so I get busy and do a good job of it. And I work at imp improving at these things so that I can be what I'm supposed to be in that horizontal creational realm. Okay? Huge distinction here. And this is why the two kinds of righteousness bring so much clarity to this. So should I be striving to be a better person? Yes. So that God will love me more? Can't do it. He already loves you in Christ completely. So that I get a better reward in heaven? Well, maybe, but we're not going to talk about that. So <clears throat> God is doing what God is going to do because of his grace. You do what you're going to do because that's what he put you here to do so that you can serve others. Now, the reason I'm stressing this is because I am very aware that in Lutheran circles there is still this strong contingent that wants to malign virtue and denigrate it and run it down. And I get that. I, I get where they're coming from. I'm sympathetic to some of their concerns, but I'm also gravely concerned about where that leads because I think it leads very quickly into a kind of a licentiousness attitude of I've got God's grace, I have my license to sin. The Romans 6 kind of thing. So we sin so that grace may, may, may abound. Paul says, no chance. But Lutherans say, oh, maybe a little bit. And so that's a concern I have. The other side of this is the antinomianism. I've written about this a lot. And I'm very concerned about that. The idea that the law has no place in my life. The law just is bad, bad, bad. No, the law is the will of God for how I should live. That's what I'm to be pursuing. So. I do believe that virtue has a place. That's the whole point of my dissertation, Case for Character. I'm trying to make room for talking about virtue as a Christian pursuit and as a right thing to do, even as a Lutheran. And I believe it's all over the place in Luther, room for this. Okay? Clear on this? So any Ferdians here who want to push back at me right now? <laughs> I'm ready. Now, seriously, I would love it. <laughs> All right, and this is not to denigrate Gerhard Ferdy, because I've learned a lot from him, and I have appreciation for him. Bob Kolb, one of my colleagues and friends, loves Gerhard, and knew him personally, and so always has good things to say about Ferdy, but I've got some concerns, too. Just, and some of you know what I'm talking about, and if you know what I'm talking about, enough said. And if you don't, don't worry about it. <clears throat> All right, now. Let's get into some more stuff in Psalm 82. And as I said, this is a great psalm. I'm really quite fond of it. Luther talks about three virtues of a good prince. And I'm not going to unpack that a lot because that's a different kind of topic. But his three virtues, I already mentioned one of them. The second one, I said, I told you that was caring for the widows and the orphans. The first virtue of a prince, Luther says, is supporting the church and enabling God's proclamation of the gospel and thwarting blasphemy. That's the first duty of a prince, according to Luther. So, should the state be engaged in suppressing heresy? Luther says, you bet. You're thinking, whoa, no way. No, Luther's all over it. Why? Because blasphemy misleads people and damns them to hell. Can't have that going on. And so, should the state be stopping blasphemers? Absolutely. Yeah, that's Luther. Take it up with him if you don't like it. So that's the first duty of a prince, is to support the work of the church. So, separation of church and state doesn't exist. For Luther. Distinction between them? Absolutely. 
but they should be working together. Second duty, caring for those who are marginalized, the poor and the needy, widows and orphans. That's the second duty of a prince. Third duty of a prince is to stop evil and to thwart injustice. And so that's where you get armies and police force and stopping criminals. That's the third duty of a prince. That's it. That's what a prince is supposed to do. So those, those are Luther's, and he calls these the three virtues of a prince, the three princely virtues. And so he unpacks this with great detail. Now, along the way, then, he gets into some interesting things as he's discussing these, and I want to get into this um, here. <clears throat> so he's discussing the role of the king supporting the work of the church. And there's just this marvelous passage here, which is going to suit my purpose very well to talk about virtue and leave princes alone here. But he writes this, and this is page um, 52 in that same volume, 13 of Psalm 82. Many kings and princes, and remember, prince for Luther is just a placeholder for any government official. Um, anybody who's got the sword, Romans 13, that's prince, okay? And this is prince being used exactly the same way as Machiavelli uses it in The Prince. You're all familiar with that. So, and interestingly, Machiavelli wrote The Prince about the same time that Luther's writing Psalm 82 commentary. So they're contemporaries. Many kings and princes have founded great and glorious churches and built temples. But even if a king could build a church of pure gold, or of emeralds and rubies, what would all these great and glorious things count for compared with one true, pious, God-fearing pastor or preacher? So a prince, instead of building these great churches, those churches don't matter anything as much as one really pious pastor serving out in the great high plains of western North Dakota. Some of you fit that bill. And so... He can help many thousands of souls, both in eternal life and in this life. So pastors aren't just for eternity, they're for now too. For by his word, and the his here is the pastor's word. So here he's now talking about pastors. He can bring them to God and make of them able and apt people. Now that's interesting. So he brings them to God. There, that takes care of the Coram Deo, vertical realm stuff, how I stand before God, and make of them able and apt people, serving and honoring God and wholesome and profitable for the world. Ow! Now he's talking about Coram Mundo realities, the horizontal realities of things going on in this world. Which one does the pastor care about? Both! Both, 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 both. It's fascinating. And Luther just does this in passing. And to me, when Luther does a throwaway in passing, what does that mean? Oh, he doesn't care much about it? Or it's just so taken for granted he doesn't have to make a case for it. And see, that's compelling. When Luther just mentions stuff along the way, that's even more significant because, oh, he's just taking for granted this is how it works. So a pastor is doing both of these things. He is bringing them to God and making them able and apt people, wholesome and profitable for the world. Part of a pastor's job. A church or temple cannot benefit a man this way. In, way, in fact, it cannot be do any helping at all, but only stands there and lets itself be helped and adorned. So what's Luther's complaint? Princes pile money into building cool buildings, and they put their name on it. You know, built by Prince George, 1540. Look at what I did. And there it is. And it's awesome. And Luther says, I get why you do it. You feel cool when you see that building. There it is for posterity. But why don't you take all that money you did to build that temple and instead plow it into a pasture or two or three. And now you will really make a difference in the world. That's Luther's argument. He's complaining bitterly about princes supporting the wrong things. And in Luther's day, this was a serious problem. I, you guys are reading ahead. Don't do that. All right. I know you do because I do. Um, I've learned this the hard way. You put text in front of me and I read it. I quit listening to you. I just read the text. Um, so now you can't read it. Oh, it's still too big. You can still read it. There you go. Read it. Feel free. Feel free. Read ahead. All right. Now, so here's the point I'm trying to get at here is what Luther is driving at is princes are tempted to build monuments to themselves. 
We like to put our money into things that make a difference, that we can see visibly and tangibly, and princes love to do this. And in Luther's day, what they weren't doing was supporting princes. Now, this becomes even more relevant for Luther because in Luther's day, who paid for the pastors? The princes did. Congregations did not support their own pastors. This idea of congregation supports its pastor, no. Congregations, the pastors were the job of the prince. Everybody knew it. A prince needed to supply a pastor because he cared about the people in his, care, in his concern and their spiritual welfare mattered. It was the prince's duty to provide spiritual care for the, the people. So the pastors were paid for by princes. And so if a prince is being tight on the pastors, they don't have them or the pastors don't have food. We have letters from Luther writing to Prince George asking for a little extra money because he needed a new alb because the one he had was worn out. He was that dependent on his prince that he had to ask for extra money for the things he needed just to live. That's how it was. So this is a very real thing for him. In other words, pastors should be number one in the minds of the princes, but they're not. Instead, they support all their big fancy building projects, and the pastor support is lousy. And Luther says, this should not be, because what does a pastor really do? And now, he's going to get into this beautiful section, and this is the best part of this, where he starts unpacking why a prince should be supporting the work of a pastor. <clears throat> but who is this prince, and where are the eyes that can see this virtue in a lord or prince? To support or protect a poor, pious pastor is an act that makes no show and looks like a small thing but to build a marble church, to give it golden ornaments, and to serve dead stone and wood. That makes a show. That glitters. That is a virtue worthy of a king or a prince. Well, let it make it show. Let it glitter. Meanwhile, my pastor, who does not glitter. I love that line. I love that line. That should be an ordination sermon. My pastor who does not glitter. You don't glitter. You're just a dude. You've got problems. You're not that interesting. You try, but it doesn't work as the way you think it should. You stumble. You're socially inept sometimes. It's just you're awkward and clumsy. You don't glitter. I'm talking about me here, okay? I'm that way. I don't glitter. And so my pastor who does not glitter, and yet, what's God doing through this guy who does not glitter? While my pastor who does not glitter is practicing the virtue that increases God's kingdom, fills heaven with saints, plunders hell, robs the devil, wards off death, represses sin, instructs and comforts every man in the world according to his station in life, preserves peace and unity, raises fine young folk and plants all kinds of virtue in the people. In a word, he is making a new world. He builds not a poor temporary house, but an eternal and beautiful paradise in which God himself is glad to dwell. A pious prince or lord who supports or protects such a pastor can have a part in all this. Indeed, this whole work and all the fruits of it are his, as though he had done it all himself, because without his protection and support, the pastor could not abide. Therefore, no mountain of gold or silver in the land can be compared with this treasure, but blessed must be the eyes that can know this, and blessed the fists that can do it. <laughs> Isn't that phenomenal? It's just beautiful. And now let's go back here because you can't miss this. Notice what Luther's doing here when he describes in detail the work of a pastor. It splits neatly in half. The first half, what's he doing? It's all quorum deo stuff. He is plundering hell, robbing the devil, comforting people, filling heaven with saints. He, he is bringing people to know the forgiveness of sins in Christ so that they have eternal life and the hope of the resurrection. That's what he's doing. And does that end his task? No. And so that's what's so fascinating about this. And then we have right here. Then what does he do? He represses sin instructs and comforts every man in the world according to his station in life. What does that mean? His vocation. The pastor is teaching his people how to do their vocations. 
Luther takes her for granted. He's teaching dads to be dads and moms how to be moms. He's teaching businessmen how to be good businessmen. He's teaching people how to be people the way that God wants them to be. It's a whole life thing, guys. All three estates here. It's not just spiritual work. It's the whole person. He preserves peace and unity. Where's peace and unity going on? Out there. This is secular stuff. This is temporal realm stuff. He raises fine young folk. We're going to hear more about that before we're done here. Raises fine young folk, plants all kinds of virtue in the people. Oh, yeah, the virtue we're supposed to flee from. The pastor is planting virtue in his people. Why? Because it makes them better people, better at doing what God put them here to do. Does it make God love them more? No. Does it make them more saved? No. Does it give them the assurance of heaven? No. But is it doing what they're supposed to do? Absolutely. So do it. So that's what a pastor does. In a word, he is making a new world. This is extraordinary. It's just such a beautiful, compelling picture of what we are here to do as God's people. We're here to bring God's kingdom, and that happens even now as we help people learn what it means to actually live this Christian life and do what God put me here to do, and virtue becomes normative of this. All right. Powerful, powerful stuff. Um, love this. All right. Questions, comments, pushback here before I turn the tune of thing. Go ahead. Don't let this go down a rabbit trail, but um, <clears throat> looking at Psalm 82, you get people who follow somebody like, uh, they'll pick up Dr. Heiser's book, um, what is it, Beyond the Spiritual Realm or whatever it is, where he starts looking at the first verse in here where some translations have divine counsel <clears throat> instead of the congregation of God. Uh -huh. And he starts looking at Elohim more as gods rather than in this world, and yeah, so yeah. they almost separate it from God working in his, with his right. people to something different. Right. Is there a resource or somehow that we can help? Because we have, I have quite a few who have bought into that. Yeah. It's, it steals the humanity part yeah, of this. Yeah, it does. No, that's, that's, that's so, right. So how... Yeah, uh, you're asking an exegetical question, and I'm systematic, so... Yeah. I'll, I'll that was just, part of the challenge. I'll just beg off on that one. Um, no, I see this, 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 and I'm, I'm kind of serious about this. I joked about it. You know, the moves Luther makes exegetically, I don't know if they're defensible or not. I don't care. And um, he's just making those moves. No, seriously, I don't, because he's making a systematic argument. Is his systematic argument consistent? Absolutely. It's airtight. I mean, and this is, this is the whole point of when you see the whole of creation, from creation to the work of redemption and the restoration and the eschatological fulfillment, this beautiful narrative, this whole arc of things, and you see how the Bible then supports this narrative arc, is what Luther's doing here with this psalm consistent with that? Absolutely. Lockstep. And so is it the best reading of the Hebrew text? I don't care. And I, I really don't. Luther's making his move. I get what Luther's doing. I know why he's doing it. I'm all over it. Now, is it possible someone can say, well, here's the better way to read this exegetically? Fine, whatever, go do your thing. But for my point, Luther's making a point, and is what Luther's saying about pastors right or wrong? Well, it's correct. Yeah, and so that's the point. Don't get hung up on the exegetical niceties. Hear what Luther's saying and own it. That's where I'm coming from. Okay? okay? Fair enough. Um, in, in my preaching, uh, sometimes I prepare better than other times no and uh <laughs> like my my bare minimum is to uh, draw the law out yeah to humble us and yeah. to bring the gospel out sure to comfort us in jesus christ yes um but that's like the bare minimum and to be true to the text when i do that yeah uh, but my uh my goal is to do that and then also to exhort unto bearing fruit and uh -huh, uh -huh. repentance. And so, like, in my typical <clears throat> pattern of preaching, that's where I would find, like, in, it's not always in that order. Yeah, yeah. But in, in the sermons, that's where I see, like, the exhortations unto Christian virtue coming yeah. in. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and if, if I'm preaching just law and gospel, I know in your book you talk about just law and gospel <clears throat> or just the gospel motivation being insufficient for yeah. teaching virtue what is what is missing if in our goal for preaching we're just looking at law and gospel preaching um what is missed if you're just doing law and gospel is if this gets complicated this gets is the case for character and i don't want to get too sidetracked 
down this rabbit hole, but I'll do it real quickly, is if you're doing law, gospel, law, gospel, the tendency is to use law in a purely negative understanding. Law is to convict, convict, as you said, humble. And the law certainly has that function. But the law is not just there to only convict. And in fact, we make a fundamental mistake if we see the law as the negative, hard word of God and the gospel is that beautiful, wonderful word of God. As soon as you make that move, you are in trouble. Because now you have painted the law black or negatively. I don't want to be race this terminology here. Um, and so you painted it in all negative colors. You cannot do that because now there's no way to redeem the law. It always comes across as the horrible heavy burden. But that's not how to define the law. And what I was just pulling up here is this awesome text from, um, let's see, get my text here right. My quote is here. Yeah, here we go. Perfect. This is Formula of Concord. This is FC Solid Declaration, Article 6 on the place, uh, I think it's 6 or, no, it's yeah, and it's, yeah, six. There he is. There you have it. FC six, and this is paragraph fifteen. However, in order to and so a form of Concord, I'm quoting Confessions here. Maybe you don't subscribe. I do. Um, so um, <laughs> the whole thing. Um, see, traditionally Europeans and a lot of Scandinavian um, who came over never subscribed to the formula. They just subscribed to the Augsburg Confession and the Catechisms. I'm aware of this. Um, I subscribe to the whole thing. I'm bound by this. So if you aren't Fine, you can blow it off, but I can't. Um, however, in order to avoid all misunderstanding, in my circles, when I quote the formula, it's like, done. You know, it's God has spoken. Shut up. And so, <laughs> so that's why I trot this baby out, okay? However, in order to avoid all misunderstanding as much as possible and to teach and maintain the real difference between the works of the law and the works of the Spirit, it must be most diligently noted that when we speak of good works that are in accord with the law of God, for otherwise they are not good works. The word law has one single meaning, namely the unchanging will of God according to which human beings are to conduct themselves in this life. That's key. That's everything. What is the law? The will of God for how we're supposed to live in all the estates, in all our vocations. The law is not negative. The law is only negative when I break it, which I do all the time. But that's not its inherent purpose. The inherent purpose is, this is what life looks like when you do it God's way. That's what the law is. So, back to the practical parts of your question. I'm doing law gospel preaching, and I want to exhort. Well, you see, this gets into the three uses of the law, curb, mirror, guide. All right, so I'm doing a little curb, now I'm going to do a little mirror, now I'll do a little guide. Really? You get to control that? <laughs> I don't think so. So what you can do is, you preach the law. And what the Holy Spirit does with it, he does with it. Some people he curbs, some he mirrors, some he guides. But it's just God's law going out. So my encouragement, pastors, is preach the law full blast with specificity. So in other words, do your exhortation and do it full blast knowing this is law. This might convict some people. This might encourage some people. This might condemn some people. Oh, well, it's God's law. And the cool thing about preaching with specificity and full force law is it really does its job. And you want to bring people humble, just do some specific law preaching and lay it on them. And it becomes very applicable. And so don't make such a sharp distinction between second and third use. It's just the law. And where you do it in the sermon, I don't think it matters that much. Just do it, do that, and then make sure you're doing full blast gospel too. Both of them full tilt. That's the key. Preachers make a huge mistake when they think, well, the gospel has to predominate, so therefore I need to back off of the law. No. No, no, no. The gospel needs to predominate, so what do I do? Preach full blast law, really kill them, and then I'll preach some full blast gospel and really make them alive. Let them both rip. That's the way to go forward. The idea of trying to balance them 50-50, no, 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 both 100%. Now you're getting it right. Okay? All right, good question. All right, now I want to jump back to um, where I was before. All right, good. Somebody, did someone else have a question? I don't want to cut you off. I saw somebody standing there like, no? Okay, fine. Good, I'll cut you off. Good. <clears throat> now, so this idea of virtue and these, uh, this training in virtue and becoming what God would have us to be, Luther talks about this all over the place. And I indicated in the last the morning lecture, the earlier one, that the large catechism is my go-to. It's my 
final trump card on everything. And the large catechism is just delightful on this stuff. So this is, I'm going to pull a couple excerpts from the small catechism here and unpack a few things. This is from the second commandment, where he's unpacking the second commandment, which is not misusing God's name, using it properly. And here's Luther giving some direction on how this works. So this is paragraph one here. I think I actually cut off part of it. It's like a little further on. Yeah, this is like 51. Above all else, our young people should be strictly required and trained to hold this as well as all the other commandments in high regard. So now here he's talking about the second commandment. Whenever they violate them, we must be after them at once with the rod. Yeah, and that's exactly what it sounds like. Confront them with the commandment and continually impress it upon them so that they may be brought up not merely with punishment, but with reverence and fear of God. So how are you going to teach this? You know, diligently. Now he goes on. Now you understand what it means to take God's name in vain. To repeat it briefly, it is either simply to lie and assert under his name something that is not true, or it is to curse, swear, practice magic, and in short, to do evil of any sort. In addition, you must also know how to use the name of God properly. With the words, you are not to take the name of God in vain, God at the same time gives us to understand that we are to use his name properly. For it has been revealed and given to us precisely for our use and benefit. All right. So then he gets into how does this happen? How do we train this? And here we have some good direction from him. He writes this. Although it may take a long time, nothing such people do will succeed in the end. Everything gained by the false oath will slip through their fingers. Okay, then he goes on. Paragraph 69. Therefore, I advise and urge, as I have done before, that by means of warning and threat, restraint and punishment, children be trained in due time to beware of lying and especially to act in this way. No good will, will come of it. It is evident that the world is more wicked than it has ever been. 15 17 or 15, 20, 30s. There is no government, no obedience, no fidelity, no faith, only perverse, unbridled people whom no teaching or punishment can help. All this is God's wrath and punishment upon such willful contempt of this commandment. On the other hand, notice the connection he makes. People aren't keeping the commandment. Who suffers? The world. The world. The world falls apart because people aren't doing what God gave them to do. On the other hand, we must urge and encourage children again and again to honor God's name and to keep it constantly upon their lips in all circumstances and experiences for the proper way to honor God's name is to look to it for all consolation and therefore to call upon it. Thus, as we have heard above, first the heart honors God by faith, then by lips and confession. For this purpose, well, here at 71 too, this is also a blessed and useful habit very effective against the devil who is always around us, lying in wait to lure us into sin. He hates to hear God's name. Many a terrible and shocking calamity would befall us if God did not preserve us through our calling upon his name. I've tried it myself and have averted and indeed experienced that often a sudden great calamity was averted and vanished in the very moment I called upon God. So what's he suggesting? We teach people to immediately call upon God in trouble and that will stop something bad from happening. Almost sounds like superstition. Almost. But you see, he believes in these things. Then he goes on. It is also helps to form the habit, notice, of commending ourselves each day to God, our soul and body, spouse, children, servants, and all that we have for his protection against every conceivable need. This is why the benedicte, the gratias, and other evening and morning blessings were also introduced and have continued among us. So Lutherans are not letting go of the traditional prayers that people learned by rote and said automatically every day as superstitious tradition. We see, it's not superstitious tradition. It's forming a habit. And that's where I'm going with this. From the same source comes the custom learned in childhood, of making the sign of the cross when something dreadful or frightening is seen or heard and saying, Lord God, save me! Or, help, dear Lord Christ! And the like. It's a good thing, he says. These are good things. Likewise, if someone unexpectedly experiences good fortune, no matter how insignificant, he or she may say, God, be praised and thanked. You're driving through the mall parking lot and a space miraculously appears on the day before Christmas. God be praised and thanked. That's what he's talking about. God has bestowed this upon me, etc. 
Just as children used to be taught to fast and pray to St. Nicholas and other saints, but these practices would be more pleasing and acceptable to God than life in a monastery or Carthusian holiness. C. With simple and playful methods like this, we should bring up young people in the fear and honor of God so that the first and second commandments may become familiar and constantly be practiced. Then, some good may take root, spring up and bear fruit, and people may grow to adulthood who may give joy and pleasure to an entire country. Notice this coming together again of the secular and the sacred. The secular benefits when this is happening. That would also be the right way to bring up children while they may be trained with kind and agreeable methods. For what a person enforces by means of beatings and blows will come to no good and no good end. So he mentions the rod, but he'd rather you be, you know, controlling, make games out of it, offer rewards, which is still the law, but instead of beating them into submission, how about enticing them into submission? For what a person enforced by meetings and blows will come to no good end. At best, the children will remain good only as long as the rod is on their backs. But this kind of training takes root in their hearts so that they fear God more than they do rods and clubs. This I say plainly for the sake of the young people so that it may sink into their minds. For when we preach to children, we must talk, baby talk. We prevented the misuse of the divine name and taught its proper use, not only by how we speak, but also by how we act and live so that everyone may know that God is well pleased with the right use of his name, will just as richly reward it as he will terribly punish its misuse. What is Luther getting at here in this commandment? We're supposed to be forming kids to use God's name rightly. How do we do that? We habituate them into it. We habit them into it. We make them fold their hands when they're two years old before they eat and they sit there and they say their prayer. And one of the first things they learn to say is, come Lord Jesus. And then they learn the Lord's Prayer and they learn it by heart. Why? Because we are habituating them. Make the sign of the cross when something scary happens. Luther says, go for it. So oh, that sounds kind of Roman Catholic superstitious. So what? Are you habituating them into a right way of behavior? Yes. This is Luther's point. This is the core to virtue. Virtues do not get learned by sitting in a lecture and saying, oh, that's a great idea. Virtues get learned by what you do and by what you do again and again and again and again. Aristotle knew this. And this is why the whole idea of rote and ritual and habit comes into play. Guys, this is not some kind of weird, crazy idea. But we seem to let all these basic truths just slip our minds when it comes to the church. We sit kids down and we make them go through confirmation instruction for a year or two. And we teach them stuff in their head. And then we send them off. There, now they're going to be good Christians. What have we accomplished? Have we habituated them? Have we formed them? Habituation is a lifetime project. It starts as soon as the kid is born. And it needs to be the church and the home working together in this lockstep process of habituating and forming children into a virtuous way of life so that this becomes who they are. When you want to master the piano, you do not read a book about piano theory. You sit at the stupid keyboard and crank it out again and again and again and again and again until it's mind-numbing and you hate it. But what happens? It becomes part of you, and it becomes you. This is how it is with virtues. You want to learn a virtue of patience, how do you learn it? Do not read a book about patience, and do not you know, talk to a counselor about it, or do not have a buddy who's going to hold you accountable. No, you put yourself in bad situations, and you force yourself to bite your tongue and to show it, and to do it again, and again, and again, and again. And eventually, you start to catch a little bit of it, and you learn the virtue of patience. It's habituated into you. We should not be shy about this. We need to embrace this and own it. This is what parenting is all about. You don't correct bad behavior by having a little talk with your kid and helping them understand why they should be good. You entice them into good behavior. Is that the law? Yes. Is that a problem? Of course not. Because the law is exceedingly effective in helping us to become what we're supposed to be because it's God's will for how we're supposed to live. That's what's going on here. Luther's getting a full-throated, hard-on endorsement of this and without any apology. And what's fascinating is he's not using the gospel to motivate these kids. He's just saying the law needs to be there. He doesn't apologize for it. Yeah, I know, crazy thoughts. All right. Now we jump down to the 
fourth commandment, which has already been invoked because this is this beast, and Luther spends a long time on the fourth commandment. <clears throat> he writes here some phenomenal stuff, but he wraps up the fourth commandment. I don't know the last time. When was the last time you looked at the large catechism? Anybody looked at it in the last year? Oh, good for you. Well done. Fourth commandment. Read the passage you just read. Yeah? I read to my wife this morning. Really? There you I go. I don't know. It must be like, like some cosmic word. It's the Holy Spirit. It must be. Yeah. It's the Holy Spirit. The cosmic reality of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeah, the section you were just reading. Yeah. About, and you were talking about habituating. Something that you and I both had growing up, I'm sure, is the Lutheran hymnal and using pages 5 and 15 for the order of Ah. Uh-huh. Every Sunday that we wouldn't have to use a hymnal. Right. Or anything. We knew every That's Sunday right. by heart. That's right. You see, and people will denigrate, oh, that's just empty tradition. Well, it can be that. It's true, and you're right. And see, the, the emptiness becomes a problem. But the, also the reality is you are laying down tracks that become part of who you are. And it's not just something I learned. It becomes part of who you are. So that, and you know how this works. So that when you encounter those things, it just feels right. Because you've been habituated. That's how habituation works. Yeah, but a follow-up. Go ahead. But it is teaching even the youngest because then I... Yeah, exactly. No, it, it all is doing this. See, this is this is the whole point. It's all doing this kind of stuff, and it's extremely potent. Um, so let me give you one more follow-up here. This is from now the fourth commandment, and this is the last three paragraphs of the fourth commandment. Well, actually, numbering differently depending on how you number your paragraphs. But this is Luther wrapping it up. This is from Kolb Wengert. Now, and was, this this is the hair curling stuff from the fourth commandment because now he talks to parents. More than enough has now been said. I'm sorry, this is a little bit smaller print, but deal with it. More than enough has now been said to all those to whom this commandment applies. Kids, people under authority. In addition, it would also be well to preach to parents on the nature of their responsibility, how they should treat those whom they have been appointed to rule. I love that word. Parents, are you supposed to rule your kids? Yes, that's your job. You're not their buddy or their pal. You are their ruler, their prince. Although their responsibility is not explicitly presented in the Ten Commandments, it is certainly treated in detail in many other passages of Scripture. God even intends it to be included precisely in this commandment in which he speaks of father and mother. For he does not want scoundrels or tyrants in this office or authority. The office, the omt of parent. It's an office just like pastor, just like prince, so is parents. It's an omt from God. Nor does he assign them this honor, that is, power and right to govern, so that they may receive homage. Instead, they should keep in mind that they owe obedience to God, and that above all, they should earnestly and faithfully discharge the duties of their office, not only to provide for the material support of their children, servants, subjects, etc., but especially to bring them up to the praise and honor of God. Therefore, do not imagine that the parental office is a matter of your pleasure and whim. It is a strict commandment and injunction of God who holds you accountable for it. So are you supposed to be training your kids to be virtuous? Yes. It's your job as a parent to do this. But once again, the real trouble is that no one perceives or pays attention to this. Everyone acts as if God gave us children for our pleasure and amusement, gave us servants merely to put them to work like cows or donkeys, and gave us subjects to treat as we please, as if it were no concern of ours what they learn or how they live. No one is willing to see that this is the command of the divine majesty who will solemnly call us to account and punish us for its neglect. Nor is it recognized how very necessary it is to devote serious attention to the young. For if we want capable and qualified people for both the civil and the spiritual realms, we really must spare no effort, time, and expense in teaching and educating our children to serve God and the world. We must not think only of amassing money and property for them. God can provide for them and make them rich without our help, as indeed he does daily. So quit worrying about what college your kids get into, what scholarships they're going to get, what kind of job they're going to get. This is what parents are always incessantly worried about. My kid has to go to this school or he has to be involved in this kind of thing. I get parents all the time. My child has to be involved in select softball or select hockey because then they're going to get really good. Then they'll get a scholarship. So they go to this really good school. So they get a really good job and be really rich and be really happy because that's what life is all about. And that's why they can't come to catechism class, Pastor. See, something's really messed up in how we're thinking about everything. And that's what Luther's getting at here. 
God can provide for them and make them rich. But he has given us children and entrusted them to us precisely so that we may raise and govern them according to his will. Otherwise, God would have no need of fathers and mothers. Therefore, let all people know that it is their chief duty at the risk of losing divine grace First, to bring up their children in the fear and knowledge of God, and then, if they are so gifted, also to have them engage in formal study and learn so that they may be of service wherever they are needed. If this were done, God would also bless us richly and give us grace so that people may be trained who would be a credit to the nation and its people, to the nation again. We would also have good, capable citizens, virtuous women, virtuous, who, do, who as good managers of the household would faithfully raise upright children and servants. Think what deadly harm you do when you are negligent and fail to bring up your children to be useful and godly. You bring upon yourself sin and wrath, thus earning hell by the way you have reared your own children. Ouch! Thus earning hell by the way you have reared your own children, no matter how God holy and upright you may be otherwise. I told you it was hair curling. Because this commandment is neglected, God also terribly punishes the world. Hence, there is no longer any discipline, government, or peace. We all complain about this situation, but we fail to see that it is our own fault. We have unruly and disobedient subjects because of how we train them. This is enough to serve as a warning. More extensive explanation will have to wait another time. Amen. Sit down. This is the sermon he preached just like that. Gospel? I wish there were some. There's none. Oof. Hair curling. Now, aside from the conviction of the law and the condemnation, you're all feeling the sting, which is just great. What is the point here? Train, train, train in virtues, holy living, habits, practices. And so what we're getting at here is not just memorizing prayers. We're getting into the whole gestalt that is the family home of how you raise children. The kinds of routines, the traditions, the schedules, the things you do, the work gets done before you play, the eating your food, the speaking with respect, the not running around being crazy kids, all this kind of stuff, it all plays into this. It's all part of this habituation and this formation that Luther is embracing because it all matters. They know Christ as their Savior and they are living a life to serve the neighbor because this is what is God-pleasing and what is exactly what God put us here to do. All right, the last thing I want to say about this virtue stuff then is the problem with virtue is we don't pay enough attention to it because we're so often afraid of it. And we're afraid of it because it smells like works righteousness, and we don't want that. And so, because we want to make sure we keep AC4 front and center. Great. The other complaint I hear about virtue and emphasizing virtue is it's way too self-interested. And this is a legitimate concern because this is exactly what Aristotle was doing. Aristotle pursued virtue because he wanted to be the best version of himself that he could be for his own sake. It was a prideful thing. And are there Christians who get into their virtuous pursuit and it becomes exceedingly prideful? Amen. That's dead wrong. And is that a susceptible problem for people who are seeking piety? Maybe. I don't know anything about that in the LCMS, but maybe you do. So, this is a legitimate concern. And I have heard this leveled, and I, I totally get this. Aristotle was totally messed up, so a Christian virtue cannot look like Aristotle. And yet, Luther, who called Aristotle that damned rascally heathen, also would turn around a few years later and say, the Nicomachean Ethics is the best book on ethics ever written. Everybody should read it. And completely endorse Aristotle. Why? Because quorum Deo, it doesn't work, but quorum Mundo, absolutely it does. And the bigger point then is this. If the concern we have is, well, virtue might be works righteousness. That's a problem. Yes, it is. And virtue is too self-interested. Yeah, when Aristotle does it, that's what happens. That's not good. But that's not how Scripture or Luther teaches it. Because for Luther and for Scripture, all over the place, what is the point? We die to self. So if I am dead to me, why do I pursue virtue? For the sake of my neighbor. And when I'm more patient and more long-suffering and more humble and more kind and more generous, who benefits? My wife, my kids, my neighbor, 
everybody around me. I pursue virtue not for my own sake so that I can be a better version of myself and look at all I've accomplished. I pursue virtue for the sake of those around me. Because when I'm increasing in virtue, they benefit. And when you raise your children to be virtuous people, the whole world benefits. That's Luther's point. So does virtue belong in the church? Amen. Is it going to justify anybody? Of course not. Is it going to make you a better Christian? Not more saved, but a better servant to those around you? Absolutely. That's where this thing fits. <clears throat> and that's what we're getting at here with the whole idea of virtue. So, questions. It's a quarter till. I, uh, I have one from the chat. Oh, good. Uh, okay, so when teaching virtue, especially to children, how do we prevent despair when the lessons start to be tough? And a related question, can we incorporate the gospel into virtue teaching at all? Yeah, the gospel should permeate our lives as Christians. It's always, always, always there. And the, see, the great thing, this gets back to the question about law gospel preaching. The great thing is when you go hard on the law, and someone's eventually always going to fall. Because no one's going to ever accomplish everything the law is supposed to do. We're all fallen people. So there's always a point where you say, uncle, I give up. And at that point, the gospel says, yeah, and you're forgiven. And see, this sets up this beautiful dynamic of the Christian life. You strive like crazy to be the best version that you can be, that your God put you here to be for the sake of others. But you know all the while that you're God's forgiven child. And it's all cool. And so I get up in the morning and I knock myself out trying to be the best I can be, working hard at things. I get to the end of the day and I reflect how to go, not so well, I really messed that up, messed that up, and I, oh, despair starts to come, but wait, I'm baptized, I'm God's forgiven child, that hasn't changed a bit, ha, huh, how cool, I get to start all over again tomorrow, yeah. awesome, and see, this is the dynamic of the Christian life, so people say, Christians are all hung up on guilt, you bet we are, Christians are totally frivolous, they don't care about anything, you bet we are. It's both these things at once because we care enormously about how we live and we obsess about our failures, but then we also have this kind of carefree alacrity that it's all cool. God, God's grace, it's all wonderful. <clears throat> no questions? That's fine yep, too. Right here. No. Okay. How would you counsel uh, young men that are kind of really attracted to this rise of stoicism again, the Joe Rogan version, human uh, maximization, uh -huh. who are really wanting to like do this, uh, grow in virtue and do hard things uh, and uh, suffer, uh, uh. but keep this horizontal kind of always before their eyes because it's this confusing thing. Because like, well, I don't yeah. know. Am I doing this for myself? Yeah. Like giving myself time to exercise, yeah. to feel better, to serve my family? Or is it purely selfish? So what advice would you give maybe lenses to help them think about that? Yeah, you see, I think the... I'm not familiar with Josh Rogan. I'm more familiar with like Jordan Peterson and you know, his attraction. Um, I get that. You can see these guys are saying things that resonate with people, resonate with men who have been mollified and feminized by the culture for so long. They're just yearning in their guts for something that gives them more, that challenges them. And this is being offered. So should the church be doing this? Yeah. And I don't have any problem with people finding attractions to those kinds of things and taking seriously the challenge and going out and doing things because this is part of what God put us here to do, to be people who are accomplishing things. The key, of course, is to integrate it into a two kinds of righteousness framework to realize this is not making you more lovable to God, not making you a better person for the sake of God. It's just making you more of what God created you to be. So have at it. Now, the thing about, okay, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to be the best version of myself. Wait, wait, wait. It's always for the sake of the neighbor. It's always got to be aimed out. It's not about yourself. You've died to yourself. You're doing this for the sake of others. So you go to the gym and exercise, not so that I can get buff and, you know, I'm going you know, to be able to bench 300 pounds or whatever. That's my goal. What's your point here? Your point is I want to maintain my physical health so that I can live the way I'm supposed to live and accomplish what I need to do so I can keep up with my kids so I'm not fat and unable to keep up, whatever. You know, I'm not offending anybody, but if I did, whatever. Um, just... <laughs> It's the Holy Spirit convicting you. Just live with it. Um, <laughs> so you, you are striving to do this for the sake of the neighbor. Always, always, always. That's the key. It's for the sake of the neighbor. And that, that's the dynamic. Okay, good? Yes? Dovetailing off of what he talked about in relation to assurance. Yeah. When, when you think about... When dovetailing in relation to assurance, when you think about our Reformed brothers and sisters, generically speaking focus so much on fruit. Uh -huh. It's like a tally of the fruit. You know, what did we do today? Did I do my devotions? Did yeah. I do, 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 do? And 
and, and, and the essential component of focusing on Christ and what Christ has done, and I'm talking in the sense of freeing us in the, you know, to, to serve in the world rather than, okay, now I have to prove it. How much of the world's influence, and I, I know there's a lot, but has come in because I've had somebody come into our church and they're just struggling with this, the, the pendulum of despair and pride. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm doing oh, yeah. really good today. Right. I, I, I'm, God must not love me because look at, I, I'm not living a true yeah. virtuous yeah. Christian life. And so in that context, is there any, any um, good context or, or good resources that you could give us as a pastor? Because I'm trying to... There's a book called Case for Character. No. <laughs> Do you know where I could find a couple copies? Uh, so, no, you, what, you're, what, you're, what you're getting at is, is kind of this the dynamic that is always there of this striving leads to failure and leads to needing to hear the gospel. And you, and you deliver it. See, the, this is what's so awesome about the churches. We have exactly what God has given us, what everybody needs. They need the challenge. They need the support. They need the direction. We've got it all. The church owns this stuff. The stuff that people, you know, are, oh, Jordan Peterson's so cool. Come on. We've got this in the church. We've had it forever. We just sit on it. We don't, and we don't use it the way we need to. We have what the world is desperately needing. And so you have all the resources you need just by doing lay the gospel on them when you need to, and you got all the training. You know how to discern it. When they need to hear the law, when they need to hear the gospel. Probably getting too big, I'll knock them down a few pegs. Humble, they're, they're being crushed. Gospel builds them up. You're the expert. You lay it on them. You be the seal sorga, the healer of souls. You know how to do it. All right, I want to give you one more thing here from Luther. This is from The Freedom of the Christian. It's become one of my absolute favorites, Luther um, pieces. This comes from 1520. Remember, this is where he starts with that very famous um, contrast. Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. And a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. So which one is it? And for Luther, it is both all the way down. So you are a perfectly free Lord of all. Where is that true? It's true before God. Before God, you are in Christ. You have complete freedom. You have nothing to worry about. And so this sounds so counterintuitive. We think, well, before God, I have to be humble. No, before God, you are Lord of all because you are in Christ and you have his righteousness. You got nothing to worry about. And yet, a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all. Where is that true? That's true in the world. Because in the world, who are you supposed to serve? Everyone around you. You are the walking, dutiful servant to everyone you encounter. It's both things at once. This is core to Christian confession. This is Sermon on the Mount in spades. This is Jesus talking to you. And then Luther wraps this whole section up beautifully in my all-time now favorite paragraph in Luther. It's just beautiful how he captures everything in the Christian life. This is, um, this is volume, uh, this is Freedom of the Christian Man. I want to say it's volume 24 of American edition. Maybe I have that reference here. Maybe I don't. Nope, don't. Sorry. So this is from Freedom of the Christian Man from 1520, and he wraps it up this way. We conclude, therefore, that a Christian lives not in himself, but in Christ and in his neighbor. Otherwise, he is not a Christian. He lives in Christ through faith, in his neighbor through love. Faith is about receiving God's grace. Love is about doing good works. By faith, he is caught up beyond himself into God. By love, he descends beneath himself into his neighbor. Yet he always remains in God and in his love, as Christ says. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open. Angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And so we are to live not in ourselves. We die to self. We live in Christ, have his full forgiveness. Faith receives that. And then I live in my neighbor, serve my neighbor, give of myself, die to myself. You want a lifetime challenge, just try dying to yourself in all of your relationships. You think you've arrived? Not even close, my friend. Because learning to die to yourself is an unending quest and is merciless. Um, And it happens the most painfully, of course, in your closest relationships. So when your spouse has done something wrong and you know it and you are going to get this straightened out, wait a minute, die to myself? It means I don't keep score. These things are hard, people. But this is what God calls us to do. This is the guts of this whole thing. And so dying to yourself, you learn that. Virtues, habits, practices, controlling. This is where it all comes in. All right, other questions? One of the things I've been thinking about is the difference between expectations and standards. Uh Uh-huh.
questions, and I wonder if you could offer any guidance on oh. how, how yeah. virtuous we should really expect Christians to be, considering the, that we're all fallen people. That's a great question. So the difference between standard and expectations. We have biblical, godly standards, but what should I expect of other people? And I think the answer is kind of right where I was just going with Luther. So from yourself, you expect perfection. And if you don't reach it, you are hard on yourself and you are merciless and you seek God's grace and forgiveness and you are always feeling like I'm a failure because you are. <laughs> Sorry, no pep talk here, guys. Um, because, but at the same time, but I'm God's forgiven child and I have his grace and it's okay and I'm content with that. But then now your expectations of other Christians, whole different ballgame because now you lo- function with charity. So do I... Expect, do I hold my children to a high standard? Yes. But I expect them to act like sinners. And they're going to. And I won't be disappointed. But in other words, and especially it's true of your peers, um, the idea of, oh, so and so, so let me down. This is where the grace needs to kick in. And you need to be one who lives in the gospel. And so while you hold yourself to a high standard, you don't run around enforcing that standard on everybody else and becoming the, the morality police or the guy who's always you know, picking everything out. Clearly, the idea of church discipline, encouraging each other, challenging sin, yes, that's appropriate. But the idea that somehow you should be doing better than you are, you have to be generous here, holding people to a, an account and calling them to a way, better version of themselves, but doing it with grace and with kindness and living hard on yourself. And it's a delicate thing, but that, again, that's why you get all the training to learn how to do that. So, good question. All right, anything else? Oh, really? Okay, that's fine. Satisfied at all, huh? All right. Then if I'll give me five minutes, I'll take it. I'll throw one more thing at you then. Wait, I got to get this up here. So let me give you this one more little taste of um, some of this virtue stuff. Um, Alistair McIntyre, any of you heard of him? Okay. Um, Roman Catholic th- theologian. Well, he is now, but he wasn't. At one time, he wrote a book called After Virtue in 1984, kind of a landmark book, just blew everybody away, Second World as well. And he was one of the first guys who kind of brought back this resurgence and in interest in virtue. And he's arguing hard for a recapturing of an Aristotelian virtue ethic and over against a kind of do your own thing, serve yourself world. And so he's one of the first guys. So if you're interested in this kind of virtue stuff, the Jordan Peterson stuff, whatever, you know, the kind of being what you're supposed to be, McIntyre really was the guy who kind of got that ball rolling all the way back in the early 80s with his book After Virtue. And he emphasizes in there the important critical role of communities communities in establishing virtues. Virtues never happen in a vacuum. They have to be reinforced by a community, and a community always functions with three key things. It has a common creed, it has common narratives that they share with each other, and it has practices, ways of sharing life together. All three of these things have to be functioning in a community. So we have a creed that holds us together, gives us a goal, a tell us we're heading for. We have narratives, stories we share and tell and hear, and they reinforce these things that we think are important. And we have these practices we we do, things, these rituals, these habits, these things we engage in. So what kind of community fits that bill? Hmm. Yeah. And in these communities, are we able to instill virtues? Yes. The church is perfectly situated to be a community that actually instills virtues and has these practices. Well, McIntyre has this rather delicious, this gives you a taste of McIntyre. Here's how he defines practice. By a practice, I'm going to mean any coherent and complex form of socially established cooperative human activity through which goods internal to that form of activity are realized in the course of trying to achieve those standards of excellence which are appropriate to and partially definitive of that form of activity. With the result, the human powers to achieve excellence and human conceptions of the ends and goods involved are systematically extended. There, one sentence. That's all easy. Now, I was going to say, McIntyre is not an easy read. But what he's getting at here is a practice is something that we do that actually engages people in it, pulls them into it. It reinforces the virtues we think are important, tells the stories, and helps to advance the cause of the community going forward. A practice is worship on a Sunday morning. A practice is a family meal. Thanksgiving dinner. Practice. A practice is a family game night that we have 
popcorn and we have these drinks and we have the fire going in the fireplace. These are things that become practices that help to extend and further the life of that community, whether it's a family or a church. We need to be smart and deliberate about these practices because this is where habituation happens. This is where formation happens. All right. Thank you for your attention, and it's been a fun morning. So blessings on your work going forward. Thank you, Dr. Bierman. Great stuff. Fun to have all of you here. It's, uh, it really is a blessing to be able to share this together. So a uh, common, common practice, perhaps, to come together and learn. So thank you for that. All right, lunch in the cafeteria for those who registered ahead of time. I don't know who those are. I hope you do if you don't take your best shot at it. And 115 back here for our other sessions. But uh, thanks again. Thanks for being here. I hope you have a great day.